Well, happy day, everyone, and welcome to uh, our webinar today. Uh, my name is Stephen Thomas. I'll be hosting our session today. Uh, we are here for thinking about VMware alternatives. Why OpenStack should feature in your cloud future? Uh, very exciting topic. I know something that's on the mind of a lot of our partners and service providers um, and cloud service providers around the market today. So again, thank you for joining us. If you do have questions, you'll note in the GoToWebinar panel on the right, there is the question feature. You can also use, as we'll be uh, managing the chat function, the ability to uh, review those chat questions as well. So please, let's make this as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, we're excited to get started with you here today. So, a couple of introductions. First and foremost, my name is Stephen Thomas. Uh, I lead uh, sales and success here in the Americas for Virtuoso. I'm joined by Patrick Dolan from Virtuoso, who is one of our business development managers here. And then I'm also joined by Ted DeVos, who is the CEO at SimNet. And I'd like to ask Ted, do you want to provide a quick introduction of yourself for the, uh, the audience, please? Sure. Uh, thank you for that, Stephen. I'm happy to be here. Um, background on SimNet is we're a Canadian hosting provider with uh, global reach. Uh, we've been in business for about two decades. Um, you know, our focus has been on high performance, high secure uh, cloud computing um, with a real focus on um, tailored support uh, to ensure our client successes. So I'm happy to be here with you today talking about how we've integrated our Virtuoso. Great. And Patrick, I, why don't you give a little bit of background for us with regards to your experience and, and relevance to the topic today? Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I've been with Virtuoso the past couple of years and, you know, really trying to, you know, learn you know, more about what our, uh, you know, both end users need and our actual uh, partners. You know, our goal is to, do, you know, work closely with them, understand, go to market strategies, use cases, things like that, where we can, you know, really partner together and, and really make an impact together, so. And I think that's a, that's a great uh, launching point, Patrick. For all of our uh, attendees out there, this is really a conversation for you. Uh, and so if you have questions about either go to market, what you're seeing from a market trend perspective, again, we're excited to get that feedback from you uh, with regards to what's happening and how you're uh, engaging in the market. And to that point, let's talk about what we're going to cover off on today from an agenda perspective. Uh, so we've just gone through our welcome and introductions. We've got a, a couple of slides to cover off on what we're seeing, both from a virtuoso perspective as well from a SimNet perspective around cloud market trends, uh, what our customers and partners are communicating to us. And then we're going to have a conversation around SimNet. And what was the, you know, their business objectives as a cloud service provider uh, and understand how they've worked with both uh, VMware as well as Virtuoso to deliver really what are strong outcomes for their customers and deliver you know, flexibility and efficiency. So very excited for that. We'll go through SimNet's journey and the outcome. Uh, talk about the, uh, the, the steps that have gone forth um, in their process of, of in, you know, starting their Virtuoso practice. And then we'll do a quick snapshot for everyone just to highlight what Virtuoso does, uh, you know, how we impact the market and the solutions that we deliver. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So let's go ahead and we'll move on. So our first topic today was just a couple of high level cloud market trends. And this is, I think, always uh, fun, but also very challenging uh, for our partners today. And we've, we've got, a, don't know where we came up with the image with the hamburger, but it does feel like I want to eat that hamburger. But the question is, are you know, are hyperscalers eating your lunch? Um, and that's something that we see actively as we engage with our partners uh, in the market. They felt threatened by the AWSs, the Azures and GCPs of the world, as really those uh, hyperscalers have launched into the market and captured what is a lot of that new business uh, that would have traditionally went to a regional cloud service provider or hoster. So again, we're, uh, what we're seeing though now, and I think particularly with the macroeconomic environment, is a bit of that trend reversal. 
And I think you all, if you living in this space, have seen uh, some of the recent posts around cost savings migrating away from uh, platforms like AWS and some of the challenges that our customers, our end customers are experiencing in operating in those environments, the complexity of operating in those environments, and sometimes what is the good old lock-in construct of operating in those environments. And so let me ask, Ted, can you talk about kind of what you're seeing in the market from your customers with regards to hyperscalers and a little bit of that trend reversal? Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of our a lot of our clients are obviously everyone is looking to get into the cloud. Um, and if they're already into Azure, AWS, GCP, um, either looking on how to offset multi-cloud as you know as a strategy, um, or really have that tailored service. So we're seeing either BCDR in a multi-cloud um, where primary workloads are on uh, one area versus um, DR in another um, type of cloud. We see that um, businesses are a little concerned about tying all of their assets into one uh, cloud strategy and not being portable enough to, to exit or realizing that when they do want to exit from their public cloud, the fees and associated with moving that data um, becomes uh, part of a risk to their business. Um, so we do see more microservices being spun up um, on private cloud or on non-hyperscaler clouds. That's um, an interesting point, Ted. Is it is it really, for you, is it largely uh, core microservices, Kubernetes workloads, things of that nature? Yeah, mostly. Um, infrastructure as a service, I mean, that's very portable, so you're not tied in one way or another. Uh, microservices, APIs, functions, you know, um, we're seeing the desire to be, um, the clients are looking for more control over their environments, um, and specifically when it comes to compliance, security, um, having more direct access in, um, instead of having a, you know, the generic interface that uh, AWS and Azure offer. Um, they're looking for that well, a more in-touch component. Yeah. Sorry, Ted, go ahead. No, no, that's good. And I think it's interesting, you know, Patrick, one of the things I think that our customers uh, and partners are experiencing with the hyperscalers in the platforms today is that complexity and the new tooling that's demanded of them to either learn or enable their teams against to operate, as Ted just said, things like compliance in the public cloud um, and some of the other core areas. Are you seeing any other trends, Patrick, from your chair with regards to kind of this this reversal and or, uh, you know, broadly with hyperscalers today? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing we'll, we're going to see more over the next you know week or two with the you know the new earnings releases coming out uh, you know a whole new wave of them, but we're already seeing a lot of warnings, a lot of trying to you know set expectations that things are going to get worse, and and they're using the keyword optimizing, and, and you know we talked about you know what is it really? Is it cut, cost cutting or is it optimizing? But we're seeing that. And what, what is also really interesting that I'm seeing is, is a shift towards, you know, uh, more professional services, more consulting. So it's kind of, um, you know, to me, you know, when I see that the, the big hyperscalers are going to do that, I'm thinking, of, okay, what are they really thinking about? You know, like, you know, to them, you know, I've run into this in the past where, you know, I've worked with micro businesses and small businesses and, and, and the interpretation of for some larger companies is a small business, you're, you're talking about a thousand or less employees. And so their their whole um, you know the whole concept and the whole perception of of what they consider a small or medium sized business is is skewed you know and it's like you know are they really providing that level of service that that some of the you know the different more regional service providers can do and the ones that are used to being a managed service provider and you know really trying to give that white glove service that, that we often talk about that's that's a really good point and kind of hitting on two things there to carry us forward to that next topic it's that relationship and then also that optimization and i think one of the things uh, patrick that we've seen quite a bit of here at virtuoso is a high level of interest in our platform because of some of the uncertainty that's in the market with regards to vmware today and i think i'd call out you know we've seen a lot of transition from staff uh, relationships that have been years in the making uh, you know, changing over for our 
uh, partners that are partnering both with us and VMware uh, for their environments. And also something I think that we can all feel and be concerned about is uh, the amount of cost savings that Broadcom is looking to apply to the uh, the environment that is VMware. I think the, the the stated number is something in $4 billion in cost reductions, and that's going to come out of R&D in different places and really impact uh, the future of development on the VMware platform. Um, so, Patrick, what 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 are you seeing in, you know, from your the partners that, that you lead and talk to around VMware today? I think the biggest thing is uncertainty. You know, like, you know, like you know, especially in today's day and age, you, you want to have a, a, a pretty good idea. You know, you have so many other things that are, that are out of your control. You have the economy, you have, you know, what's, what's going on as far as, you know, all the layoffs and the, the industry, you know, and, and new things. You know, there's exciting things as well. You know, there's things comes coming up with AI and all kinds of different things that people are excited about. But that uncertainty causes, you know, anxiety, you know, and that's part of the thing is, is and, you know, I, I'm aware of what's happened that, you know, I wasn't personally involved, but, you know, there's been, you know, a couple of acquisitions in the past um, that, that, you know, that people are afraid of, you know, is this going to happen to VMware? So I don't know, you know, Stephen, you know, we, we you was, know, was you aware of any of that? Is a long time Symantec guy having very direct experience. Uh, certainly it's, it's a, uh, it's a challenging place to be, uh, you know, and we're, we're here to help those partners who are dealing with those challenges you know, either offer a secondary solution that they understand and can commit to for the long term. But again, that that is one of those challenges and risks. Uh, you know, Ted, as a as a user of VMware today, is there anything specific that's really impacting you and in your relationship with your VMware team members? Uh, things that you're concerned about with regards to what's happening with the Broadcom acquisition? Well, I mean, not just with Broadcom acquisition. I mean, we've been a VMware shop. Uh, exclusively for you know 15 years with our private cloud um, we've you know we weren't able to leverage them as a partner we were just really you know a vendor they were a vendor to us so I mean our team certified and we do the training and you know we we offer the services but they, they don't really adjust to our needs at all um, you know we are just a, a consumer to them or we're consuming their platform um, which made it difficult when trying to tailor solutions um, that are very specific to some organizations that you know we host um, or that we're trying to host you know even with our white label offering that's where you know virtuoso has really stepped up and taken some of our feedback and is really no really no work with us um, so that's a big differentiator not just from the acquisition but just from a, a relationship perspective um, it's important that it's bi-directional um, you know, you help us, we help you kind of mentality. Um, as far as the acquisition goes, pricing is a huge piece, right? So especially with everybody's, you know, uh, familiar with, uh, you know, the, the, the word of inflation, um, how things are, where the spend is with, you know, license costs going up with VMware. Um, and they have been, you know, consistently this past year, our clients are you know, not willing to absorb that cost because they have their own costs that are increasing. So trying to maintain a level of, uh, you know, CPI, the consumer price index that uh, supports the business outside of a license fee that's gone up, you know, 20, 30 percent in a year. Um, that's a challenge. So, you know, you guys have provided um, a very cost effective approach um, to offering, you know, more abilities um, that we couldn't do before. So that's a that's a big piece. Um, the Broadcom acquisition, I mean, it's a hit and a miss what, where it's going to go. Um, they haven't been successful acquisitions in the past, so I really don't have a crystal ball on that one. Yeah, yeah I don't think any of us do, and I think that's the the point. I think for the on the bright side for this crew here listening in today, you know, there is still the observation that you know, ninety percent of the global IT spending is shifting to cloud. And again, cloud can mean a number of things here, uh, but still being excited about the opportunity to participate uh, and drive that business with your, uh, with your customers and partners. Well, that's, so, part of the, that's part of the piece, right? I mean, sorry to jump on it, but um, part, part of the cost of operating is really the cost of support, right? So when you start talking about hyperscalers and you talk start talking about the the certifications and the team and the technology that the 
that your staff have to have to support a hyperscaler um, with all the different flavors, um, just the labor costs are high. Um, so simplifying the cloud stack and offering uh, a solution that is like or better um, with people that are talented and have the ability but don't need to have you know 30 different certifications that say they they know what they're doing um as a business my your costs aren't that your costs don't scale the same way so you're able to control that better um versus you know microsoft coming out with a new certification that we all have to adopt to a new partnership level because they've changed their models again um that matters well i, I think that speaks to you know some of these bullets with regards to the, the cloud market itself and what we're seeing from customers. And this data for everyone on the webinar came from Forrester. And it speaks exactly to what Ted just addressed, which is, you know, 70% roundabouts of organizations lack the resources or expertise to realize full value of their tech purchases, whether that's that's your CapEx spend on hardware or whether that's your, your public cloud spend, that complexity and particularly in public cloud, uh, the rate of change, and we could look at just simply uh, what, what we're seeing with OpenAI and ChatGPT and talk about rate of change. You know, this is a place where people want some level of control and consistency. Uh, and I think, Ted, you know, one of the things that we strive for here at Virtuoso is consistency in how we engage with our partners. And I think that's true for what, uh, why we're seeing a bit of an uptick is both customers and partners want a consistent, method by which they buy uh, and by which they engage. And, and I think that's really important. But uh, Patrick, talk to me, uh, you know, with regards to um, some of the, uh, the, the the IT service providers in that advisory component and what you're seeing about the need that customers are communicating to partners with regards to requiring, you know, that advisory rather than simply just putting their compute in public cloud. What are you hearing from partners there? Shoot, I thought you were going to ask me to, you know, give a quote from, or a, 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 I just got a, a great joke from Chat, you know, you know, GPT on AWS is great, you know, but nonetheless, we can come to that later. Um, it is amazing, you know, the, you know, the, the advancements and things like that, you know, of, of what we're seeing. And, and the thing is, you know, like, like, you know, Ted was talking about a, a few minutes ago, you can't even keep up with certifications, let alone, you know, all of the different things coming out and how quickly things are going to, continue to advance. So I think a lot of times when it comes to, you know, small and medium sized business, you know, then even when you get in enterprises, like they really want to feel confident that they have a team that's looking out for them. And, and I think that, you know, these numbers are so obvious as far as, you know, you know, these came from, you know, Forrester, like 70, you know, 80%, things like that. They, they need that partner. And that's what I really think that, that service providers are, you know, the, the MSPs and the other service providers, they've really positioned themselves as a partner. So you, you want to know that you have a team behind you, you know, you have, you know, all the technical resources and, and if you need something, they're there for you. And well, I, I think that speaks to that bottom bullet here. And, you know, as we transition, it's about, as Ted said, and I think this is one of the reasons for the, the folks on the webinar today, one of the reasons we have, you know, Ted and the Simnet team is their core objectives is to deliver what is outstanding customer service, that white glove service uh, to their organizations. And I think that's, we talk about that trend reversal of people coming out of public cloud back into private cloud or regional service providers is being a real driver, wanting that relationship and that proximity to the people that are servicing your team members in your business. Let, let's kind of continue on. And, and Ted, you know, one of the things that we're hearing from our service providers, you know, as we talk about the need, you know, that need to inter integrate the vendor, the OEM, and the cloud service provider relationship, you know, tying into how do you accelerate that multi-cloud adoption? Can, can you talk to us about some of your customers that, that look to you to drive that multi-cloud adoption? And where do they start in that journey with you? How are they what are you seeing from them with regards to that starting point and what are those top priorities for them today right um so the journey usually starts with clients that have on-prem um they're on-prem with aged equipment or you know they're trying to get more performance out of what they have existing and they're looking for an alternative um and then it's kind of like 
you know, talking to your accountant about how do I save money on taxes? Who do you go to to trust about your um, your cloud strategy? So you ha you have to find someone that can give you an agnostic view, and that's difficult, right? Um, so we're biased, obviously. We love our private cloud. Um, it's it's ours. We built it. We know what it does. So we migrate them to our platform and then give them the options to do uh, either BCDR, um, so backup disaster recovery, um, in another cloud so that there's some protection and some guarantees there, some really some resiliency if needed. Um, most of them start with the on-prem, they move to, they'll lift and shift, they'll move their infrastructure to, you know, IAS, um, infrastructure as a service with us, and then they'll mature into more of a microservice, you know, um, cloud adoption, cloud application, cloud native um, application, where it could be with us, it could be with, you know, a microservice somewhere else because they want to segment the network. Um, and that's really where we see a little bit of that transition when it goes to, oh, we thought public cloud was secure by default. Um, and that's kind of like saying, you know, my car is fast. Um, who knows? Uh, it is how it's built, right? So we only build it one way, and that's a secure way. So segmentation, layers on layers on layers. Um, when And we architect it for them. So what they're seeing is that level of architecture on the onset, that, you know, which is the lift and shift migration from mostly flat networks um, to, you know, um, networks with better uh, ACLs between segmentations um, to microservices that are now either in a, another cloud or, um, you know, uh, with us again uh, on, a, on a segmented uh, section. So a lot of it is, um, I mean, we tailor the needs, right? So clients that are moving from public cloud to us, that becomes a little bit stickier because when something's cloud native in AWS or Azure, or even VMware, um, you have a hard time coming back So to something that's portable. So with Kubernetes, that's more feasible, um, makes it more agnostic, and we can control that better. But that has to be part of the strategy, and that's part of what we offer, and that's why you saw previously was, you know, who do you speak to or why are we moving? Businesses don't always have an IT strategy that way. They don't really know. That's not their focus. They, they know what they want to do to grow but they don't necessarily know how to leverage the technology stack without using a label. Um, whereas when you can start building where it's agnostic, um, then you can really provide value. The customer's not feeling threatened because they can be portable if they need to. You lock them into a contract, but they still have the ability to lift and shift their data instead of being tied to a particular platform. Um, that's an important component. So, no, and I, I, oh, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, actually, you know, it's, it's a good time maybe for one question that I have here that, that you know that, that I have when it talks about the whole strategy, things like that. I think it's important. So I, I did want to get into kind of migrations and workloads and a lot of different things. And, and I have, uh, you know, one specific question that came from the audience is is how hard is it to migrate VMware VMware workloads to you know SimNet and Virtuoso? But you know, that's where you get into the, you know, along with that question is what's the strategy? You know, what do you usually advise as far as like, hey, take a look at this workload, take a look at that. And then, you know, it, and if you can help, you know, address some of that question, at least as far as, you know, how difficult it is. Sure. Um, so the, the the migration itself, I mean, it depends. Um, it, it depends on what the workloads are, obviously. Um, between either it's going to be a replication um, that's leveraging high stacks that's going to move right from VMware into Virtuoso, um, or it's going to be a you know a live transfer, or it's going to be a backup and restore, moving from um, a VMDK to a KVM type platform um, is quite seamless. Um, the impact is. How do you build the network the same, right? Moving the workload is straightforward. I mean, that's just ones and zeros moving from one platter to another platter. Um, standing up the standing up the compute again, straightforward. Um, now making it secure, um, that's where the design comes into place. Um, how are you connecting the two together? 
How are you allowing ingress, egress traffic? How are you shaping that traffic? How are you protecting everyone along the way? Um, that's where the art comes in. Um, the virtuoso interface for VHI is quite, um, is quite, I, I like the word simple because it's easy to use. So it allows that flexibility to um, not need the depth of knowledge of uh, the OSI stack to know where you are. It's going to give you firewall rules. It's going to give you uh, compute rules, storage rules um, that let you, you know, use the term earlier, uh, right size I'll use um, for the workload when you're coming from a VMware to a virtuoso environment. It's also quite efficient, so you don't need exactly the same uh, like for like sizing. Um, you get a little bit more performance depending on where you, on how that initial VMware design was built. If it was running iSCSI, or if it was spinning disk, or if it was on NFS, or local storage, or vSAN, migrating that to Virtuoso on their software-defined array, flash storage, uh, the performance is top-notch. Excellent, hey, and, and thanks for that, Ted, and that journey. We'll talk a little bit more about it here in just a moment, but let's talk maybe specifically about SimNet here for a moment, Ted, because I think a lot of our audience looks somewhat like a SimNet, you know, regional cloud service provider, service provider delivering, you know, those white glove services to their customers. So, in, you know, when you think about the core business objectives of SimNet, we've talked through a couple of things, but these are some of the business objectives that helped, that you wanted to deliver and that frankly, you know, you, you look to Virtuoso to help enable um, you to deliver those. Can you talk just about a couple of the key business objectives here uh, and what you're really trying to achieve? Well, we just came through COVID. Um, so I mean, that's not unique to SimNet, that's that's unique to the world. Um, and what COVID did was gave this fundamental shift of workplace. What workplace meant, what virtual work meant, what work remotely meant. Um, and what that did was, you know, transition folks from VPN to SDN, um, transition folks from, you know, thick app to thin app, um, you know, laptop to to no no laptop at all and VDI. So what what all that means is, you know, we had staffing issues um, through COVID. Um, people looking to transition to move to to be more flexible. Um, so part of our goal, as we tried to retain more staff, you know, we obviously had to be more aligned and more aligned means, you know, be in line with um, the dollars that are being spent on IT staff. Um, as that quick change happened, at least in Canada it did, um, it about a 30% increase in salaries for folks um, over a very short period of time, over a two year period. So we had to align that, and then where are we getting, where are we doing that, and how are we going to, you know, be competitive if this is what's happening in the industry? So we looked around to try and find the competitive edge, um, which was what I said earlier, which was simplicity. Um, make something simple, make it easy to use, make it resilient, make it fast, um, and then lower our cost of operating it so that we can have the margins that we're comfortable with and we're used to having um, with the increases um, everywhere else. So that was a big shift, right? Um, how to adopt, because we were a VMware shop. Um, you know, uh, the shift over COVID the past three years transitioned us to look, uh, how do we realign our business? How do we become more, um, how do we offer a better service to our customer without compromising with the value that we offer with price? So that was the that was the balance that we were trying to trying to make. So Virtuoso was the milkshake that we ended up with um, at the end of it. And, and again, it, it you know, for those in the audience, when, when we've talked with Ted about this before, it's that delivering SimNet, as he described, as a service in the flexibility. And I go back, Ted, because you mentioned it, the ease of use uh, of the platform, right? Not having to go through a significant enablement cycle uh, for your organization around a new platform. So that's a big piece, right? So go to markets fast. So that was a big piece for us. I mean, there wasn't this big learning curve. Uh, it's not, um, you're not leveraging OpenStack through, you know, command line. Um, you know, you still, you're still techs and the guys, you know, they know their stuff, lots of depth, but 
for the knock team you know you have like what 16 people on the knock team they're just l1s l2s that are just trying to you know they're they're trying to support our customers they don't have this massive ramp to be able to support a new platform it's important um our infrastructure team i mean they've had time to dig in and they know the stack well but not everybody who gets to support it has that you know handoff from you know build development to productionizing um so that's a big piece so we were you know within two months we're able to to go live and be able to support it and that really comes to you know what we were able to deliver as well um because a whole new service offering opened up for us right with um how we go about enabling our end users uh, with a new self-serve uh, function, which is new to us. Um, well, let's let's talk about that journey a little bit, Ted. You know, what is you talk about enabling the self-service component, kind of where you were and then where you're going to, right? Yeah, the, sure. You know, you've got yeah. the, the three data centers. Uh, we were just talking about that, that core kind of ease of use component. But but help us with that going too, right? It was it was self service as you went through the journey. It really is to deliver flexibility for your customers. You know, it, well, as, so that was part of it, right? So as our uh, you know, and I say that the 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 industry's changed. So there's a there's a there's this need for instant gratification or instant reward and that is somebody wants to spin something up when they want to spin it up you know as much as they love to call you know put a ticket in or email support or whatever they're going to do um, and then have us do it they still want to be able to spin something up on their own um, so we were using you know a self-serve portal that had functionality um, but the virtual so platform is just night and day different right so it is self-serve so our our client base, you know, wants us to have the depth of knowledge and the the flexibility of our you know support offering and you know all of those good things, but they also want to have the ability to self guide if needed, right? It gives them that comfort of knowing what they have. They want to be able to see it. They want to be able to identify with it instead of just having a report and a monthly bill. So we you know we were able to do that um which is something that is very welcoming to this new uh post-covid environment uh, of having um that instant access to you know their uh, platforms when i think ted you know as we were talking about earlier that trend reversal where really what you're trying to do is almost accelerate that trend reversal one of the things that right. we see really well, that a yeah. AWS and Azure work for a lot of organizations was the simplicity of standing up a new instance, standing up some well, compute. And so that's where that's where AWS and Azure really start. That's where they were good, right? I mean, hey, here's a self, here's a self serve portal and go do it all on your own, right? So we had a customer, you know, that ha asked us, hey, can we do a lift and shift? We want you, and they didn't want to go to our private cloud. They wanted to go to they wanted to go to Azure, and they were in a data center and they. You know, they had a Microsoft audit and they were on the wrong side of the audit. And so, you know, Azure said, if you spend the money with us, you won't get the fines. I'm like, okay. So they went, you know, we did the migration for them, but we told them it's like for like, right? Now you need to build it, secure it, and all the rest of it. Anyhow, a year later goes by and we only did the migration for them. You know, they have their own IT team. Uh, a year later goes by and like, oh, you know, did you know that <laughs> we left and we used them uh, left ports open on the way in and nobody knew so they thought you know azure was secure um, but that's it's kind of silly right i mean it's just somewhere else it doesn't make it by default secure it means that it's just hosted in the cloud so now they're looking at how, what are our better what are our options what can we do um, oh we need this we need someone to manage this and we don't have you know, we can't afford to have, you know, architects and, and security folks and everything else on our platform, on, on our staff. So how can we make this better? Um, so we ended up migrating them from Azure to our platform, um, giving them that self-serve access and then locking it down um, by design so they don't have that risk, right? So immediately they're compliant, immediately they're, they're secure, their cyber hygiene has, you know, increased tremendously um so we're you know those are the benefits of them when we talk about our white glove service it's not just that hey we're gonna you know we're there to hold your hand um 
like we're there, we're there best, you know, best of breed uh, technology. Virtuos is part of that cloud stack, um, but also best practices. Um, and because we implement them, we're accountable for them. Azure, AWS, they have best practices, but it's on you, right? So big difference. And I think that's, that, that goes back to what we were talking about in those cloud market trends where, you know, people, they, they want the advisory service that someone like a SimNet or many of our, you know, cloud service providers and partners and many of you out there listening deliver today. They want that handhold rather than simply being told, you know, the, the world is all easy and all encompassing, uh, you know, in a hyperscale or public cloud. And I think too often um, our, our regional service providers, they, they do that work, but they don't enable that self-service. So you need to partner to deliver kind of ease of use in partnership with advisory. So they're, they're getting the outcomes that they would get from a hyperscaler while engaging in a simplistic manner to deliver the outcome. Right, and I think if you were to summarize all of that in one word, the word is trust, yep. right? They need someone to trust, they don't really care where it goes, right? As long as it's trusted and it meets their business objectives, um, then you're good. And Virtuoso has enabled us anyways um, to offer that to our clients, right? Because we are the trusted advisor. So they're gonna listen to us as to where it needs to go as long as the outcomes meet their needs and they aren't the ones that should they're dictating the technology they're the ones that are dictating their their need of value their need requirements which is performance security availability um and then access and access is a is a piece that's important well let, let's talk about some of the risks that i think there are a lot of people out there that are you know hey this is this is complex i'm not sure i want to you know again to your point I know VMware really well. I understand it. I'm certified in it. You know, why do I want to go to this new thing? What were the risks that you kind of mentally went through or even experienced in your journey to Virtuoso? Oh, lots, lots of risks. I mean, it's a new platform. So, you know, anybody who's thinking new, it's, new it's not you, a risk. This, this is us buying the used car, new to you, not new to the market. <laughs> right, well, that's just it, right? So it's a new platform to my team, right? So. For us, it was you know nomenclature, learning new pieces, learning learning the language, um, but it's common language, right? So they, we went through the risks. We we beat the hell out of it, right? So we spun up a lab. Um, we you know we had it in production or not production. We had it on production equipment um, where we built it out. We you know tried all kinds of things to break it. We did um, it. You know, we speak out what was self-healing, what wasn't self-healing. We went through all of the different scenarios to identify risk, um, identify what could happen in production from compute failure to storage failure to network failure to, you know, one node, two node, how many nodes need to fail, um, you know, segmentation, isolation, uh, I, you know, network overlap, all kinds of options we took the risk and we threw it out the window so there isn't a risk to us anymore like we're quite comfortable knowing where the limits are um and we're quite comfortable knowing that um in a lot of ways it's more secure than our vm we're offering because of the way it containerizes um which is very important to us um, so some of our clients are looking for that higher level of security um they're the ones that are first to move and they're the ones that are first to benefit um as we you know continue the journey of migrating we'll always have both because you know there's a need each one satisfies different needs um our vmware environment is great for clients that have legacy infrastructure that are trying to maintain that um that really want hands off um which is fine um but most of the companies that are looking to grow scale identify themselves as, you know, um, that want to get cybersecurity at some point. Um, those are the ones that are on our VHI platform. No, and that, that's great to, to hear. Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, I know that we're kind of starting to get limited on time here, but first of all, I just want, you know, I, I like the, uh, the whole Azure, you know, security thing. You know, the first thing I think about is, this is exactly why I need to hire an electrician these days versus trying to train myself. That's right. and then, like, Certain things I know that I should not touch because I've had a problem before, and that's the you know that's the thing is people get into these things and hey I can do that but you know I think there's a 
time and a place to turn it over to professionals. I did have another question that I just want to throw out there. I know that we're, we're probably going to get a little bit more into OpenStack and things like that, but uh, there was a question just like how, um, you know, how much, how familiar were you with it to begin with? Did you try to do things on your own first or, you know, what, what made you make, make the final? Yeah, so we always jump on our own first, right? So the team's technical. Um, so, you know, they're not shy. Um, you know, we created virtual soda nested VMware environment. So, you know, that we had it everywhere we went. Um, but I mean, the professional services that, you know, your folks offered is what helped us get to market uh, quicker. Um, so, you know, we went through a proof of concept um, with your team doing the deployment. And then uh, that was the environment that we beat the hell. And then um, our production environment, your team, you know, your professional services is what um, guided my team in making sure that it was stood up properly and nothing's missed. So every I is dotted and every T is crossed, um, which is what's important to us because that's our resiliency. Well, and I think that goes back to that partnership component. And again, you know, having a relationship, not just being a vendor, being a partner. And we talk about that, you know, with all the service providers we operate with, we always endeavor to be that partner. Uh, certainly we're not perfect, but but it's a, it's a core thematic for our business. Well, listen, we're running out of time, uh, and I just wanted to give a quick, uh, quick snapshot of kind of what is Virtuoso. And you know, again, I, I think Ted's kind of spoken to this, so I'm, I'm not going to hit it over the head. But you know, a full stack, hyperconverged cloud platform. Uh, if you have questions about it, uh, you know, reach out, let us know. Easily usable. Um, to Ted's point, we often do proof of concepts. Um, and or simply a demo environment with those service providers that are interested in learning more about a platform uh, that, that may be kind of a, a secondary platform or a new platform to launch a new service offering on, uh, whether that's specific to DevOps or Kubernetes workloads, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, the, the component on how we can operate from a financial perspective, we've got many different models uh, to reflect our customers and our partners' businesses. Uh, that allow you to have success and shared success uh, with our platform, which we think is important. Uh, and finally, you know, we're committed, and I think uh, we, we've hopefully shown that through this conversation to making not only you know SimNet and TED successful, but all of our partners successful in leveraging our technology uh, to scale their business and deliver new and compelling offerings uh, to their existing and new customers. And I'll leave, but you know, just one quick story. We were on the uh, on a call with a customer who uh, was largely a VMware shop, but was passing by a number of customers that were too small. Uh, they didn't have the time or effort. And again, setting up in that case, a virtuoso cluster to enable that self-service has allowed them to capture customers that they traditionally wouldn't have participated with and align them to a new market that is often fast growing. Uh, so those SMBs that are fast growing, that are wary, or have had challenging experiences with some of the hyperscalers. So again, we're happy to partner with all of you here. Uh, you know, is is virtuoso. Um, we're very, very excited and thankful uh, for Ted and the SimNet partnership uh, that they've delivered. Uh, obviously, if you've got needs or questions with regards to uh, cloud services, infrastructure services, uh, application as a service. Uh, Ted and the SimNet team are, are there to help you deliver that. Uh, and again, if you're a service provider out there or interested in understanding what's next for me, uh, maybe I'm wanting to consider something that's, uh, uh, you know, an alternative to the classic VMware environment that you've been operating, please reach out. Uh, we've got great product specialists here across the team, folks like Patrick uh, and the rest of our architecture and engineering organization uh, are here to really partner with you and help you qualify in or qualify out. You know, are we going to be a good alternative uh, for your business? So Ted, I, again, I wanna say thank you so much for uh, your time with us today. Uh, let's yeah. open it up first and, and foremost and see, uh, Patrick, do we have any other questions from the audience that we wanna uh, play in here before we wrap up? Yeah, we just had those couple that we addressed in, you know, during the, uh, you know, the the discussion so far. Anybody else? Yeah, I see. I see one here, Ted. That is, um, when you talked about kind of the white glove services piece, and you were operating in that VMware world, 
it says here you you know the question is what what are those vmware customers expectations is you migrated them into the new environment have, have those expectations changed for your customers that have traditionally had a vmware uh you know infrastructure versus are now operating inside of a vhi expectations i mean so in the vmware environment it's just you know it's cpu memory and disk right so i mean how they accessed it is what's changed um, the yeah anything any of the workloads i mean like i mentioned the, the performance is wasn't an issue um access um, is really what's enhanced so the expectation was we were able to you know show them that we're able that we're going to be moving them more into a cloud environment and more instead of less traditional um it's vmware somewhere else okay and then uh, how do you at the then we got another question just on kubernetes workloads and how do you see that being leveraged differently you know obviously vmware has tanzu were you using tanzu and then what what are you using from uh virtuoso to deliver those kubernetes workloads is that experience better give us the basics there yeah so the yeah so Tan, so, so we're using tanzu um the difference the difference is is that um with virtuoso uh, load balancers um vxlan um you know the clustered kubernetes it's it's next 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 to set up um it's not super complicated the team can support it easily um versus building that out in vmware is much more challenging to support um a little bit trickier to to make resilient um so no that 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 experience has been positive i mean that's the fundamental reason why at the end of the day we chose uh, to go to virtual so it was the simplicity of of deploying and maintaining um so when a customer wants to set up a kubernetes instance they click a button right answer a handful of questions and it's done um auto scaling uh ready to go so you know that's a big plus yeah well that that's about all the time that we have for for questions here today uh to all of our audience members we appreciate your participation uh the great questions that you submitted for us today and and ted uh, and obviously, let us know. Uh, you, Ted's out there on LinkedIn. Reach out, follow him, uh, connect, reach out, follow Patrick and I and connect. And we'll be excited to hear your stories uh, with regards to whether it's VMware, whether it's hyperscalers, uh, whether it's Virtuoso. We're excited to get engaged as a community and continue delivering excellent outcomes uh, for our customers. Uh, so again, appreciate it, Ted and Patrick. Everybody, you, this will wrap, wrap the webinar and we'll wish everyone a wonderful day. All the best. Thank you.